Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. internationally recognized expert in facial plastic surgery and has published numerous textbooks and peer-reviewed articles, received many honors and awards, as well as presented on the national and international level. Please welcome the chairman and director of the Center for Advanced Facial Plastic Surgery, Dr. Babak Azizadeh. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with Dr. Azizadeh, Really excited about this one because it falls in the healthcare world, which is where, as you guys know, this is kind of my area of expertise for the last 22 years. Dr. Azizadeh from the Center for Advanced Facial Plastic Surgery in Beverly Hills. How are we doing? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to chat with you. No, this is going to be a good one because uh, you know we're it, it's healthcare. Healthcare is a, a different uh, landscape right now. It's a, it's a competitive landscape. Uh, that we'll get into. But first, Dr. Azizadeh, please introduce yourself. Give us a little background, education, career journey. How did you get to this point today? Well, I'm um, a facial plastic surgeon in Los Angeles. My practice is in Beverly Hills. Um, I'm a clinical attending at Cedars-Sinai and a faculty at UCLA. I uh, did my most of my education at UCLA undergrad medical school. I did a head and neck surgery residency at UCLA as well. And then I did a facial plastic and reconstructive surgery fellowship at Harvard, and then came back to Los Angeles to set up my, uh, my, you know, practice and uh, get involved in all the wonderful things that I've had the opportunity to get involved with. I love it. Now, now you have a very interesting background because you migrated to the United States and then you started your entrepreneurial endeavor. Talk about your transition, your story. Yeah, so I was 10 when I moved uh, to the United States. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, just like most immigrants, didn't speak English, you know, uh, my parents working class, trying to kind of make ends meet. Um, you know, academics had always been important, although I did not get into the academic world <laughs> until I was at, well into high school. Uh, it was just really, really hard, I think, to just, uh, you know, transition. But, um, you know, in, in our families, and this is, you know, one of the things that, you know, I talk about, it was just like education, education, education. And, uh, you know, best public school was UCLA that we could afford. So we ended up, I ended up uh, luckily getting into UCLA. Uh, I never actually thought I had really business acumen, to be honest with you. I was never in that space. I was surrounded by people who did, you know, whose families were affluent and were in the business world. But I I just thought I was going to go be a great doctor because I loved uh, talking to patients. I loved solving problems uh, and so forth. And really, I I would say the business uh, and entrepreneurship really came in once I started my practice. Uh, and so I never really thought that was going to be a world that I would have an enjoyment. And it's been really kind of more of my avocational, uh, process, which is really exciting because I've never been, you know, like, uh, oh my God, if I, this business doesn't do well, I'm, I'm going to lose it all. So that's kind of, it's been cool because it's been fun and it's been like, kind of like, you know, enjoyable. You know, and you mentioned something because I think people um, may not know this, but most providers, even if you work for an academic medical center or a community hospital, you kind of act as an entrepreneur, right? Your your goal is to go and build up your patient panel. So can you talk to the folks kind of through how how it what is what does the true role of a provider do outside of just clinical care? Right. What does the role of a provider do? Well, you're 100% right. And this is, I have a fellowship program and, you know, some of our fellows go on to become faculty members at academic institutions. Some go into private practice. 
And basically what I tell them, is like, look, you're running a team, right? Wherever you are, you are running a team. You have a P&L, right? You have a profit and loss. The academic institution is going to have a cost center for you. Your cost includes the employees that are dedicated to you, the marketing that's dedicated to you. You have to be able to manage your team. You got to get your team to excel and to be able to do what they need to do to make you successful. Um, You have to understand compliance. You have to understand HR laws. So all of that is running a business. And even, you know, even though you're getting paid by the institution, if you're not profitable for the institution, you're not going to have a job. So, um, so it is, it is like whether you're in private practice, academic, as a physician, you are a small business owner and everything that's important for other small business owners is important to you. So you have to keep your eyes and ears open about what's going on in the world. Yeah, it's very true. And that that's kind of where the physician liaison, you know, folks for uh, unaware, that's where my role kind of comes into play. I become the communication conduit between our specialists, right, uh, that are doing facial plastic surgery versus our community provider who actually need that support that, that, that don't do that care. Right. And so we build those relationships. So, so we know now, right. Physicians are entrepreneurs, right? Absolutely. So now with that said, how should physicians work harder or work smarter, not harder when they're a solo pr- uh, practitioner? Well, um, as a solo practitioner, I think the way, um, you know, we were talking about this with a few colleagues the other day, uh, the world in the next five to 10 years is going to be divided into really physicians who are employed by academic institutions, physicians who are employed by health maintenance organizations like Kaiser and so forth, physicians who are uh, employed by community and public hospitals. And most physicians are going to be owned by private equity otherwise. Very few will fall into a fifth amorphous category of private practice because private practice without institutional backing is going to be very, very difficult in 10 years uh, because insurance reimbursements uh, are going down. You're not going to have leverage with uh, insurance payers to pay you a fair market value for your services. So you either have to develop what I call a mill which is like use mid-level providers and just like, you know, crank out, I would say uh, not as high level of care as personally I like, Um, or you have to go concierge, charge cash, and just like, you know, provide a little bit more of kind of that Marcus (laughs) Welby medical care, which is spend an hour with your patient, but get paid for it. So as a private practitioner or as a physician entering the space, you have to really decide what, you know, all of these options have pros and cons, all of them. There's no bad option, but all of them have pros and cons. So if you're going to be more on the entrepreneurial level, truly entrepreneurial level, you're going to have to look at the private practice world. You got to look at the private equity world and see what you can do. You have a little bit less control when you're Um, hired by Kaiser or by OHSU or by, you know, the public hospital in the community. Um, And um, those are kind of where I see uh, things happening. Yeah, and that's a great point. Unfortunately, you know, folks that are maybe unaware, I think in the healthcare world, um, you, we saw this consolidation of the private practice uh, back in about 2015 to 2018, And that really had to do, you know, not I'm not saying this was the fault, but the way the Affordable Care Act was created and the way it really tried to leverage the EMR, electronic health care records, it became such a financial burden for these individuals. So for those that independent, you know, think of yourself as an entrepreneur and you just get a 10x operational cost in one year, right, for a software that now you are required to use. Right. Yeah. It's not like, oh, you can possibly use it. No, these individuals, these, you know, again, these practitioners that were entrepreneurs were now required to use this service or this this the software and some type of EHR. Right. Didn't have to be epic or, or one script or whatever it was. It just had to be some type of EHR. And that really was difficult for a lot of folks to move. And then we saw this 
this consolidation, right? And, and, but to your point, we're still seeing the need for our physicians to have this entrepreneurial endeavor and mindset. Do you feel there was any like formal education and throughout the healthcare process that provided that? No. And that's one of the real, real, um, I, I would say, uh, shortcomings of medical education. Really, there are no courses that teach you about options, what you need to do, understanding finances, understanding business growth opportunities, understanding even academic medicine. Everything's just kind of by osmosis for the most part. And that's, it, it's a real, I would say that's probably one of the biggest weaknesses of our educational process. And it really puts the doctors at a major disadvantage because as we just talked about, you're coming out and wherever you're going, you have to be an entrepreneur. You have to be a small business owner mindset. You have to learn how to manage uh, your community, manage your patients. So it's a it's a major weakness. And I would say, I wish I had some of that. It was really self-taught and there are, there is information out there, but you have to almost like, look, this is a very important thing that you have to do for yourself. Yeah. And, and, you know, now the more I'm starting to think about it, you're starting to get my brain turned here. Um, continuing medical education, right? The way uh, continuing medical education is in fact defined is it has to be able to help you in your practice, right? And, and, and provide a learning gap. Entrepreneurship and business acronym, that's actually a big learning gap. I think that, you know, people might be able to think of, hey, how can we create a one hour lecture and accredit this so our providers get this AMA, PRA, category one CME, but they also get business. Acronym. Now, with that said, we, we've talked about entrepreneurship. We talked about a competitive landscape. How do you build a successful practice in a competitive healthcare landscape? I mean, um, the way... Um and, you know, plastic surgery world is uh, ultimately very competitive. And in Beverly Hills, you know, basically you have a ginormous concentration oh, yeah. of doctors. I think it goes back down to the following, um, uh, you know, kind of really providing the best care possible, exceeding your patient's expectations. That's the first thing. When you exceed your c customer, consumer, patient expectations, you will develop a word of mouth. And now it's social media, that word of mouth is critical. So that's the first thing. Number two is do great work. If you're a doctor, you gotta be a great physician. True. You can't, I mean, bad physicians do survive out there because there's such a shortage, right? But you have to be a great physician. Um, I think the experience that the patients are uh, getting in your practice or whether it's, it's very important. There are oftentimes people forget like the person who's greeting and picking up the phone is the most crucial person. They are the face of your practice and they are the lowest waged earners in most practices. In my practice, they are the highest wage earners because they are the first critical contact point. And then really doing great work. I mean, ultimately, your work is really, really important. Yeah. And understanding marketing, because that marketing, again, how do, how do you interact with doctors? You know, majority, uh, you know, I have a pretty active social media uh, account, but the majority of patients I actually operate on are referred by other plastic surgeons, dermatologists, or my own patients. So, um so that that's really do great work, provide great service, exceed expectations, and uh, be a great person, be a great human being, treat people well. Complications happen, unhappy patients come up. Those things are natural. If someone tells uh, tells you they never have complications, they're either not doing enough or they're really lying about it. But how do you manage that, right? right. How do you take care of the patient, make sure that their issues are resolved? Those it's are some of the great great point in fact you know what i'm gonna provide a great example for this folks at home um in fact this is exactly kind of what i do in my role and this is how we help our providers succeed uh you know when we're talking about doing great work we, one of our providers dr john hunter he's an esophageal surgeon 
There was a new esophageal surgeon coming into the state. However, Dr. John Hunter's, you know, nationally known. He's top death style of, of uh, outcomes, right? Because esophageal, it's your, it's your throat, very complex uh, surgery, very great outcomes. So when we had this other individual coming into the community and saying, hey, we, we can provide this service, I'm like, that's great. But you know what? Let's go to marketing first. What am I going to market? I'm going to market our outcomes the last five years. Here's the volume we've been getting. Here's the outcomes. And here's how it actually lines up nationally. Right. And I take that out to the community and say, hey, by the way, here's our provider that's able to do esophageal surgery. Here's his outcomes the last 10 years. I know there's somebody else coming. You can do whatever you can go. You can refer who you like to. But I just want to let you know this is this is the quality of care you're going to receive when you get sent over to this location to this provider. Right. And, and because it is a competitive landscape, unfortunately, healthcare. You got to keep the lights on. It is a business, folks. I, I know it's sometimes difficult to talk in that sense, but it it is, a, a, you know, we do uh, support the economy. We do support jobs, right? And we do support patient care. It's, it's all actually in what, and we support education and research and all these other things, right? Now, now there's, there's you know, easy, there's a lot of aspects of, of, of enjoyment, right? Easy, or maybe not easy, but enjoyable. So starting the business can have its rewarding moments, what are some of the aspects that you have found relatively enjoyable, maybe even easy during this, uh, during the early stages um, in particular? <laughs> the most enjoyable moments for me are happy patients, transformative patients. When I get an email like, you know, uh, of a patient who really had something that we took care of some you know, and it could be as simple, believe it or not, as a rhinoplasty, right? I had this teenager who was, you know, had a really what I call nasal dysmorphia. Like, you know, the nose was just like, this wasn't like a little bump in the nose. The nose was just, you know, had made tremendous psychosocial impact on her. She was an introvert. She didn't want to go to school because she was being teased nonstop. And a year later after her surgery, and they traveled from Vegas to come and see me. A year later, she's wearing makeup. She's going to school. She's going to the their homecoming. Life has changed. Uh, or when I get like, you know, somebody who had not, you know, had not gone out socializing. And after their surgery, they're sending me this glam shot. Oh, I'm going on my first date in five years. Um or like a, someone who I like treated for facial paralysis and they're going to college, they're getting married and they were born with this issue. So that's the most enjoyable thing. Um, it, I, I also, I mean, for me, I also find uh, enjoyment in like, um, you know, the growth process, right? Myself, am I getting better as a doctor? Am I getting better as an employer, am I getting better at what I'm doing? I enjoy a lot of things. I publish, I have other healthcare v uh, ventures that I get involved with. All of those little things make my whole life really complete. Yeah, and it, I gotta tell you, um, folks uh, listening, if you haven't had an opportunity to go to some of these websites and listen to some of the patient stories, uh, because most healthcare organizations will highlight some patient stories because it is quite remarkable what, you know, the, the outcomes that some of these procedures in the, that providers are able to do to really change and impact individuals' lives. In fact, you know, your front desk employee, the, the first point of contact for those patients, you also impact these individuals' lives on a daily basis, right? Every, every person that touches these, uh, these patients really impact them on a deep way because you have to remember as an employee right we're getting paid to be here we're being paid to be at that location we're getting paid to provide that service those patients are there because they need to be there right there there's something that they need to correct and, and that sometimes is very scary so just remember that when, when patients are coming through your door really treat them the way how would you want your mom or your grandma to be treated right and that's the way you treat every single patient that comes to this door Right now, hundred percent. Now, with that said, right there's there's some enjoyable things, but there's also some challenges in, in healthcare. So, uh, you know, entrepreneurship in, in particular comes with its fair share of uh, of challenges. Could you share some of your significant hurdles you've encountered? Well, I mean, I think as a physician, um, there are two main major challenges. 
Uh, one is, I would say, the regulatory mm, yeah. challenges of how, you know, you have to, you know, your licensure, your uh, hospital credentialing, the oversight of that. It's a lot of work, challenge, cost, and burden, right? Um, the second challenge is patient satisfaction, mm, right? Yeah. So we want as physicians, and as you said, outcomes are critical, right? You go get a facelift, okay? You know, you, um, you know, each surgeon has their own outcomes, right? You could go to a surgeon that's good and like 80% of their patients are happy. You could go to a surgeon that is exceptional, 98% of their patients are happy, but there's still 2% of patients. So if you do 300 surgeries, high volume, you still are going to have every year six patients that may not be satisfied by the outcome, either because of the nature of the surgery, it wasn't anyone's fault, it's just the healing process, or the patient expectation was not met or the surgery didn't achieve the outcomes that the surgeon expected, right? right? So that's still a lot of, to me, that's still a lot of people yeah. that have not been, uh, even at the most exceptional level, like your esophageal cancer surgeon, you know, that doctor will have a lot of complications yeah. because esophageal surgery by nature is very complicated. Yeah. They have leaks, they have infections. I'm sure there's deaths involved with that surgery. So even at the highest level of care, with the best intentions, with the kindest and most technically gifted surgeon or physician, there will be some issues. And that, that's the hardest part, I would say, seeing those patients and not helping or not achieving where they want to be, even though 98 to 99% of patients achieve everything they want. I feel bad for that 1% of patients. And then to compound that, the way that right now doctors are judged mm -hmm. are yeah. a lot of times it's like Yelp reviews, yeah, Google reviews much so. and all that stuff. Again, if you have out of 99 out of 100 who are happy, maybe one will go and put some. When people are happy, they don't post anything. Yeah, but that one out of the 100, that voice can get amplified and for doctors, that's the difference in their livelihood, because if that amplification or someone is really, really upset about something, and it could be real, and it could be not real, um, that can really impact doctors' lives. And not just financially, forget about the finances, like, we, you know, the the emotionally intelligent doctor, yeah, which is the human. Yeah. they want to have, gets really emotionally hurt. <laughs> When patients put mean things on social media or websites and so forth. So that's really the balancing act. And it's that I would say today is the most challenging, at least one of the most challenging things. Yeah, and that's, that's such a great point. And I, I kind of want to highlight that a little bit, you know, for the folks listening is our providers, the, the healthcare workers, even in hospital administration, they go through a lot of judgment. Uh, and, and their judgment is sometimes, in fact, you, you kind of alluded to it, uh, attached to financials uh, and, and your your um, uh, performance. Uh, for example, Prescani and HCAP scores. Uh, Prescani and HCAP scores are patient satisfaction scores where, you know, if your hospital doesn't do very well in your HCAPs, if, if, they, if patients continue to come to your hospital and say it's dirty or they continue to say it's loud or, you know, they have these various questions they ask, you will get deemed, right? And so it's, it's, it's tough because providers, you at home, folks, you listening at home, when somebody writes a, a snarky remark on your Facebook page or your Instagram, you have an emotional reaction, right? We all do. We're humans. Now, imagine that times 10. Because again, these individual providers are truthfully, they're getting their names dropped in the comment section, like you mentioned, like a Yelp review and saying, this doctor did this, I don't like this, or this hospital did this, I don't like this. And it's, I think that starts to come into the, the um, concern about burnout and mental health within the, the healthcare space. Now, what is your kind of experience with burnout and mental health and wh where do you see it at and where can you see it being resolved? Yeah. 
I think it's at an all time high. I really do. I it, it's it's at an all time, all time, all time high. Mm-hmm. I think the majority of doctors are burnt out. I agree. I agree. Getting burned out earlier and more extensively than yeah. ever before. I see colleagues around me. I would say ninety percent of the colleagues I know around me are not happy being doctors. They're burnt out and so forth for a variety of different reasons. Um, how I have maintained myself in terms of my mental health and my own, you know, inability, thank God, not getting burnt out is I really make decisions for my practice decision, my ex, ex, uh, family life, my uh, outside ventures to keep myself, you know, happy. I don't like, you know, having a mill. I like a very boutique practice. I do a few surgeries that I love and I do them, I think, really well at the volume that I like, providing the care that I like. Um, And if I don't like some aspect of a surgery that I, I, I stop doing it. So I just focus in on the surgeries and the areas that I really enjoy. I try to develop a phenomenal relationship with my staff. So I have, you know, key employees that have been with me for over 12 to 15 years, multiple key employees that keeps my life a lot more uh, enjoyable. Um, And, you know, I, my family life, I really pay a lot of attention to, and my other ventures, my academic, educational, other entrepreneurial ventures in the healthcare space, I enjoy those a lot. So it keeps me from getting burnt out. And if I don't enjoy them, I will like wipe my hands off and say, look, this is not what I want to do. What do I need to do to get out? So I try to really do the majority of the things that I love. There are some limitations. Obviously, we talked about the regulatory. We talked about you know the unhappy patients, et cetera, et cetera. But those are really, for me, knock on wood, haven't been a major problem. But I know for some of my colleagues, they're just kind of like, you know, they, they don't enjoy doing what they're doing. And it's kind of sad because we are in the best field in the world. Being a doctor is a privilege and an honor. And I think hopefully we can really tackle this problem. Yeah, I, I completely agree. You know, I travel the state of Oregon often and meet with a lot of community providers. And one provider recently said, you know, it's almost humanly impossible to be a doctor these days. You know, just the amount of um, stress and, and time and work and you're seeing patients, you know, for eight hours a day and then you still don't have time for the EMR. So then you have to go home and chart. It's just, so I'm just saying this folks, because, uh, you know, folks that listen, I really want you to just kind of take a step back because the pandemic, I think the healthcare industry had went through a lot during that time, a lot of mistrust. Um, but in truth, we have about three to 400 providers that commit suicide on an annual basis. That's the size of an OHSU graduating class. Think about that. The entire class gone in one annual year, you know, and, and they're, we're just here to try and to help truly we're, we don't know everything, right? Uh, I think you kind of mentioned it earlier, you know, sometimes it's difficult to help patients when you really can't help them, right? We, you know, this the same thing with genetics. We have a lot of great genetic testing, but sometimes we, Hey, we might know that you might have this genetic gene, but we don't know how to fix it. So it doesn't really help to tell these patients like, hey, by the way, we know you have this, but we, don't, we can't do anything about it, right? That's, that's the worst the worst possible feeling as any provider in any hospital really has. But I, I just really wanted to hammer this point home, folks. If Please thank your providers. Thank your healthcare. They're your nurses. Your, you know, even, even down to your food and nutrition folks that are actually serving food providers. Everybody in the healthcare world is, is very strange. I'm not saying that other industries aren't, but I've been in the healthcare world for about 24 years. I've never felt it more... Um, I would say, uh, it's, it's rough. I don't even know how to explain it. It's, it's, it, there's, there's a lot of tears sometimes. I'm not going to lie, folks. There's a lot of tears, uh, behind these, behind these zoom calls sometimes. And we're talking about you, our community. How do we help you and our community? Um, now let's, we're moving away. I'm sorry. I know trying to not trying to beat on the dead horse here, but now let's, let's get back into the entrepreneurship stuff. And let's talk about you and building your brand. So let's talk, talk us through the strategies and efforts you have employed to build and establish your brand. Yeah, I mean, um, number one, building a brand is a continuous project. Yeah. <laughs> it never stops. I've been in practice for 20 years. And guess what? This year, I have to revamp my uh, website, I have to revamp my logo, I have to revamp my 
uh, various aspects of the front facing aspect of your practice, the first impression. So the brand is critical because your brand is basically telling the your patients what you stand for, right? Is it something like cutting edge? Are you cutting edge? Are you all about empathy? Are you all about expertise? What is What do you stand for? So the brand is very, very, very important. The second thing is how does, how do you stand out amongst other people, right? That's a little bit more difficult to do now. I would say that has changed so much in the last 20 years. And 20 years ago, you built a beautiful brand, you built a beautiful office, you put some advertising in the local magazines, you went and shook hands with your colleagues in referrals and the community, and you built your, your word of mouth. Um, now, word of mouth is built, I would say, primarily via social media. And social media, whether you stand out on social media or not, is draw of the love. I mean, there is a lot of things that are going on. Are you going to be the personality who's going to be wild, crazy on social media to attract patients? Or are you going to be uh, professorial? All of it makes a difference. And um, it's become entertainment. That's the one area I don't love personally, uh, because you have to be an entertainer on social media to draw likes and so forth. Or you have to be large institutions like OHSU and other that have huge, huge presence on, on uh, both social media and in the web world. So brand building, you got to just focus on yourself, be yourself, be who you are, put out. But branding is really only as good as your team. If your team does not reflect your brand, they're not, then it all goes away, right? That first impression, that continued uh, impression that uh, um, patients and consumers will get is critical. So that's really, uh, it's a it's a 24 seven job. You are continuously having to rebrand or tweak your brand all the time and your team. And your team may be, like the team I had in my first year and for my needs in my first few years of practice are very different than my needs now. It doesn't mean they were bad employees or they were not. They're just like, you know, you got to have employees that fit your goals. And that's another thing that you have to continue to sleep change and improve on. Yeah, that's very true. You know, you kind of have to have the right people on the bus, right? And, 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 you know, speaking of branding, you know, for folks listening at home, if you you know the marketing world, if if you're familiar with the marketing funnel, right? You, how do you basically take? How do you get uh, people aware of your product or service, or so as a provider, right? Provider trying to get them aware. Then how do you get them considered to start to re build the referral? Then you want to build a loyal referral. And then you actually want to try to bring them into your system. If you want to learn how to do that, I'm actually going to be doing a presentation uh, September 7th for the American Association of Physician Liaisons talking about the provider referral funnel. It's something I recreated, and it basically goes through step-by-step -step of what should the marketing be doing at this point in time, and what should the physician liaison be doing, and what's the goal, right? Because each step has a goal. And, and for example, we might go to one community and say, hey, again, this is, a, this is very inclusive of entrepreneurship. You might go to one target market with a specific goal, right? But each one of your consumers, you're going to target different based on where they're at on your marketing funnel, right? It might be somebody that's a little bit more loyal. They're part of your fan. Okay, then that means you're going to have a little bit more direct communication versus awareness where you're just for the provider world. We're just going to conferences, right? Going to large conferences, showing what we're doing. Versus if we're trying to create a really nice loyal referring provider, okay, I'm actually having one-on-one -on -one meetings with our specialists, building that relationship, right? And so those are just things in the healthcare world. I'm happy if folks, again, if you're listening, if, if you're like a healthcare executive or you're a hospital and you want me to come present, please let me know. I'm happy to do this. I do a lot of national presentations about the refer referring provider funnel and how do we build these relationships? How do we scale our businesses? Um, and again, I'm happy to, if we can figure out a way to do a CME, we'll do it as well. Right now, Dr. Asita's day, how, how do you like, let's, let's give us some, 
some actual valuable entrepreneurial advice, either from the physician perspective or the entrepreneur perspective. What advice or maybe what's one thing you would have known before you started your entrepreneurial journey? Um, I think entrepreneurial journey, I think it requires two critical things or three critical things. Number one, you got to be passionate about what you're going to do. If you don't have a passion for it and you're just trying to make money, forget it. Yep. It's going to, you're going to burn out. You're going to hate life. You're going to do this. Even if you make all the money in the world. So number one, you got to be passionate about it. Once you're passionate, you got to have a vision. You got to know where you want to go. Okay. And if you don't have a vision, it's like putting, you know, basically closing your eyes and trying to get, you know, get to a destination. Very difficult to do. Not impossible, very difficult to do. So you got to have a vision. And the third thing I really believe, you got to have a great team. You cannot, very few entrepreneurial endeavors are solo jobs. So you got to be able to be collaborative. You got to have a team. You may have a team of uh, people who are going to be at the same level as you, or you got to have a team of people who are going to do the things that you need to get done. Whatever, wherever that is, that's your team. That's, and you have to be able to motivate that team. And the way you motivate it is with the passion and vision. So that's why these three things are very, very important. Don't focus on money. That's what, unfortunately, a lot of people who think about entrepreneurship, they're like, I want to be rich. I'm going to be an entrepreneur. That ends up being fool's gold because all that does is just kind of you're, you're create. Then you get the, you make the money. You're like, okay, wait, okay. Now what? Yep. Right. Yep. Um, so if, if you have those three, three components, the collaborative nature with your team, uh, vision and passion, you know, uh, the world's your oyster. That That's very, very great advice. And folks, I, I cannot stress this enough. If, uh, if you kind of come into the entrepreneurship world thinking you're just going to be rich and get quick, man, you're going to, you're in for a rude awakening. It is a grind every day in the entrepreneurship world. I mean, I'm up at night thinking like, what do I need to update on the website? What do I need to do for the newsletter? What do I need to do for the next episode? There's always something in your mind thinking, and to your point, um, it, you might not get paid the first, you know, couple of years. So it might take some time, right? But it's a hell of a journey and it's fun. It's, 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 I wouldn't change it for the world. So for the audience interested in reaching out to you, maybe learning more, how can they connect with you? How can they learn more about you? Yeah. So, um, it, I'm like really, really good at, uh, social media responses, direct messages. Uh, my Instagram is at DR day. That's probably the best way, uh, to reach out to me. I'm like very, very active in responding to, to people. I get emails, calls from people, Oh, can I, you know, talk to you? Can I observe you? A anything. I'm very, very open to it. I'd love it. I'd love the mentorship uh, and anything I can do to help. I'm always there. And I'm so, I'm really, Gabriel, it's awesome you're doing this because I know you bring in a variety of different um, guests, but this is super cool because this is something I actually had never, you know, there are a lot of entrepreneurial programs and podcasts and so forth but i think you're really going granular on it and in a whole you're looking at entrepreneurial endeavors not just like the classic oh i'm going to go get venture backing right. i'm going to do this and that you're looking at hey i want to do a podcast that's an entrepreneurial endeavor exactly yes and you got to do this 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 and this to get that and if people think that way they can get not only a lot of you know uh, you know excitement and pleasure out of it, but it can be a very, very potentially rewarding uh, process. So this is super cool. And I'm really honored to be on your show. And uh, I appreciate, um, you know, your, uh, your vision. Well, thank you so much for the kind words. I appreciate you being on the show. I, I, I enjoyed this conversation quite a bit again, because it's in the healthcare world. Uh, and again, I, I, the goal is to really try to help folks get inspired and think entrepreneurially, you know, probably jump into it. My goal, I think I'm going to steal it from Angel um, uh, uh, Nunez from Beacon. And he said he wants to inspire a billion people. And this is how we're going to do it. 
if we yeah. can influence a thousand people and those people influence a thousand people, and then those thousand people influence another thousand people, we have then influenced a billion people, right? How are we going to do this? Podcast is one. Uh, for those folks that are listening, we've officially started our nonprofit business accelerated Latino founders. We have funding for it. We have 11 different entrepreneurs that are going to come through our business accelerator program. And at the end of it, we're going to do a pitch Latino competition where these individuals have the opportunity to pitch their ideas in front of venture capitalists. In addition to that, we have earmarked $100,000 in grants to give out to these entrepreneurs. Now, grants is free money. This is for you to scale your business, either for operations, for marketing, whatever you need it for to help you grow and scale your business. And so that's how we're going to do it. And thank you again, uh, Dr. Aziz Day, for being thank on the show so because much. I really appreciate uh, the, the work and uh, the healthcare providers do and the healthcare uh, professionals uh, around the world because it is a it is a taxing job uh, sometime. And again, folks listening, for those... All this information will also be on the Shades of E newsletter. So you can visit the Shades of E.com. You can subscribe to the newsletter. I will have Dr. Aziza Day's website information, his photo, as well as some just background information. And then you also get some good little entrepreneurial insights on the newsletter on a weekly basis. So if you're not subscribed, I would highly, uh, I would highly suggest you do it. Now, before we go, is there any last things you would like to say to the listeners? No, enjoy life. Enjoy, do the things you love. That's the number one thing. Do the things you love. But don't forget, you still need money to make a living and have, you know, pay for things. So, you know, there's a balancing act, but enjoy what you do. And, uh, and this is a, you know, and listen to this podcast. This is like really, really a great podcast. Free education, folks. Free education. I'm telling you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Babak Azizadeh, Advanced Facial Plastic Surgery in Beverly Hills, California. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you, Gabriel. I we've we've connected on LinkedIn, so I know I think we're we're going to continue to have some conversations offline, and hopefully, uh, you know, continue to build that relationship. Folks Thanks. listening at home, thank you again so much. Please hit that follow button. Please leave a review if you have not already, and please subscribe to the podcast and the newsletter. Thank you, and have a great night. Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.